Hello, Cinnabar Moths, or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, Cinnabar Moths podcast about all things publishing and books. Today we are here with Robert Creekmore, author of Prophet's Death. Robert, how are you doing today? Most excellent. Um, you can call me Rob. Everybody does because my dad is Robert Sr. So everybody just calls me Rob and has for most of my life. But let, let me just say that every time you say that on your podcast, all I can think about is Silence of the Lambs, where they go to the laboratory to identify the moth they found. And, and the guy says, say hello to Mr. Atarantia Sticks, better known to his friends as the Death Heads Moth. I, <laughs> so I suppose that I will be a Death Head Moth this time. But that's okay. the kind of moth I can choose to be. Well, there you go. You're Rob the Death Head Moth. <laughs> That's right. So just call me Rob. We'll keep, you know, uh, we'll 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 keep it uh, we'll keep it short and just call me Rob. Okay, that works. Uh, so Prophet's Debt is coming out uh, this upcoming Tuesday, the fifth of July. And are you feeling excited about the release of Prophet's Debt? I mean, who wouldn't be? You spend a lot of time, you know, in isolation working on a piece and just hoping that someday that that piece will get out into the hands of someone else and influence them in a positive way. How could I not be extremely excited about that prospect? I mean, it brings me back to when I was a kid living in you know, rural North Carolina, which is where I still am. And I would go to the library and I would be so excited to go and to, to get all these books and bring them home and look through them and read them. And, and those authors to me were like superstars, you know, anybody who, who, who had a piece published. And then there were people whose books I would read and they would be long dead. But to me, they're in my ear then. And to me, like thinking that one day maybe someone will go to the library long after I'm dead, pick up my book, and then I will be whispering to their ear from across the ether. I mean, how could I not be excited about that? I used to go and I look. I'd look at like where the CR is in the Dewey Decimal System in the library and go, that'll be where my book is one day. And so I guess that I finally arrived at that day. You finally have. And so speaking, it sounds like the writing has been one of your dreams since you're very young. Oh, yeah. Uh, how long ago did you start writing Prophet's Death? Well, Prophet's Death is my second book. I wrote my first book in 2014. It's called A Fear Eye. A Fear Eye is a science fiction novel. Now, the thing is, science fiction is my passion. I love science fiction. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of what I was doing when I wrote A Fear Eye was trying to emulate someone else. I'm trying to be Kurt Vonnegut, you know. And while I love science fiction, in this book that I wrote, I have a lot of pride in. It may not have been the genre that I should write in, and I may have been imitating others. So um, when I decided to write another novel, I thought about trying a different genre. And I'm not really sure what genre Prophet's Dead is. It's dark. It's horror. It's thriller. Um, it's LGBTQ+, plus, uh, and autism you know, autistic characters, it's Southern Gothic, it's revenge, it's everything, you know, that I could possibly throw in it <laughs> to make it something that would be uh, accessible to uh, anyone who, who wants to put their hands on it. And, you know, it's adventure, it's mm. um, all of those things, you know, and, and I, and it's, it's something that, you know, I wanted to write characters from my area who don't get a lot of, uh, uh, of stuff written about them. And people like myself, like I'm autistic, you know, nobody talks about, you know, well, they talk about the South and talk like about it as a monolith. But a lot of people don't talk about the South, uh, about the diversity in the South and the people from the South who are not this stereotype that, that uh, a right. lot of us have been portrayed as. And I wanted to pull out those people and see see this these characters here, these, these these folks here, they exist here too, just like everywhere else. 
and there's diversity here, it's diversity everywhere, and and come see, you know, and, mm. and, and that's what I, I decided to do with this book. Yeah, so it sounds like your origin point for writing came with with your original book was oriented towards something that, looking back on it, you think it's a you you love the work that you've done, but maybe it doesn't allow you to fully express your own self in your own original way. Right. You know, Albert Camus uh, wrote what he would call practice books. So I kind of like feel like a fear eye. Uh, my first book was kind of a practice book. Now, I wrote a fear eye when I was starting to have a kind of a, a psychological meltdown. Um, and I wrote it in like four and a half months. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's relatively coherent, you know, but, you know, I could see the mania that it was there at the time I was writing the book. And um, then I look at the book that I've written, that, that I've written as Prophet's Debt. And I see that I was very, uh, you know, particular and meticulous about how I wrote it instead of frantic. Uh, mm. So that that that's that's kind of the big difference. And and I just don't think that me myself am a good sci-fi writer. So you know, why not get the practice in? I got the practice in, and then I went for something else. And uh, went went with the it was dark, and you know, I mean. There's a lot of darkness in all of us. And I thought, why not take that and deal with it in a positive manner and put it on the page? Hmm. Okay. And so you you mentioned that in 2014 is when you wrote your first book. And then when did you start writing Prophet Step? So 2014, I'm sorry, I got off. I ramble, but that's fine. Um, I'm a writer. It's kind of expected for me to be a little strange. <laughs> um, so I wrote that in 2014. Not long after that, I ended up in the psychiatric hospital because, well, I was having a psychiatric meltdown, um, you know, and that was for the best. After I got out, um, my, my wife suggested, well, I had therapists that suggested that I should do um, journaling. Right. Uh, mm. and, and that's a very this wonderful thing to do. Journaling for people uh, going through stuff. And I was dealing with some stuff from my childhood. Um, and I'm not really someone who wants to write something that's that's uh, not an allegory for, per se, like something that's really just, you know, me and wide open, even if I'm the only one that's going to read it. So my wife gave me a, a writing prompt. I'm not going to give you the prompt because it would be kind of it would kind of give away a little bit of the book. But she gave me this writing prompt, um, and so around 2016 or so, she said, uh, "Well, if you're not going to journal, why don't you do this? You know, I'll give you a writing prompt. You've written a book before. Write another book." So she mm-hmm. gives me the writing prompt. So I, st- I just I just sit the blank page. I just start writing. And because I was still dealing with a lot of stuff, and mind you, I'm, I'm it's pretty much lifelong. I have psychiatric issues and there are things that I'm dealing with. I'm always going to regress and progress and regress. But I started putting that on the page. And then I would take a few days off or a few weeks off, even a few months off. So I think it probably took me three years. I got to a point where I had kind of a rough draft of it. And the rough draft I had was written kind of in a uh, like immediate rest where I started in, in the middle of the story. And then I have my character telling the story to someone else and then catching up to them. And, and, and anyway, that, that was really the way it worked best for me personally, but the end product didn't end up like that but as the therapy tool the therapy tool that this book was uh originally is very different than the book that it would become but it's still very much a part of that book okay so it started off as a way for you to process everything that you're going through and then 
from there you took it and you refined it and changed it into the story that it is today. That's correct. Um, actually, that was uh, yeah that that was a, a suggestion of Christopher's that that I changed. Um, and and so that's kind of how the current book that we have now came to be. Okay. And, and so what would you say that process was like for you of going through with the starting of it and using it as a, as a therapy tool and the process of then taking this thing that was originally a therapy tool and turning it into the book, the story that it is today? Well, the process was originally, you know, I don't think I took it seriously at first, but as as the as as it snowballed and became this bigger and bigger thing, I became kind of very protective of it and then very secretive of it, and I was the only one that had access to it. So eventually, what happened is I gave it to I gave it to my wife. My wife liked it, but she actually liked my first novel better in this original form because my wife is also like me. She really loves science fiction. So she was very much enamored with my science fiction novel. Not as much the first version of this novel, but the version that's in now she she likes quite a bit. Um, but so what happened is that um, so about 11 months ago, there was a, I, I don't know how I got this comment on my Twitter page, but it's from this really great writer named C.W. Allen. She writes middle grade books. Um, I like her a lot. And she wrote something along the lines of, there's a place for anti heroes, but um, I don't like it when there's not consequences or growth art. Um, so, Christopher, I suppose it was Christopher, Cinnabar Moth Publishing. Um, said on Twitter, we agree that some stories are, unless the villain is meant to be irredeemable and unsympathetic, some people are irredeemable. And I reply, someone asked me the moral of my second novel, and I said, quote, some motherfuckers need killing. <laughs> okay, so out of that interaction, that was like about 11 months ago, it was like last July or August, um, I got in contact with Center by Moth, specifically Christopher from Center by Moth. And Christopher asked for the first 50 pages of what would become Profit State. It wasn't called Profit State at the time, and I'm not going to say what it was called because I do think it kind of gives away part of the story. But anyway, I gave Christopher the first 50 pages. Yeah. And Christopher liked it a lot. But the issue was the way that it was written. It was written in a third person way. And so Christopher's like, if you will write this in first person, we'll publish it. I was kind of taken aback because, you know, I never really intended to have it published at all. I I really never um, like write query letters or anything like that for this novel. It's just something that I had sitting around so i i jumped at that opportunity and i was like sure thing i'll i'll rewrite the entire novel which i did and it was a bit of an ass pain because of course there was new stuff i had to write and it wasn't just turning it from third person to first person i had to kind of weave together some of the chapters from from certain parts and, and move them to the beginning of the book and, and move some of the stuff from the first part of the book to the middle of the book and the end of the book. And I eventually rearranged all my pieces to make this new puzzle that made a picture that I think really shows a better a portrait of what I was trying to express in the first place. And, and I'll owe Christopher a lot for that because they said that if you know, you were to do this, I think you'll like your novel better. Mm. 
And that was correct. Because when I was done with it, I like profits that so much better. And I, you know, so that that's how it came to be. It, became, it was this, <laughs> it was this piece of like journaling allegory that I wrote uh, over the course of years. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, over a course of six months, it became a novel. I actually finished it on Christmas Day of last year. Yeah, I wrote for about six hours on Christmas Day and put the nail in and was finally done with the structure. Okay, so this sounds like it was a process over many years. And Correct. with that, it truly felt like an evolution for you. And you actually... Part of that evolution came from you coming into contact with Cinema Moth Publishing via Twitter, which you are correct, uh, Kistfer does handle the Twitter account. And so Kistfer got in contact with you and you got in contact with Kistfer and through that collaboration, the book evolved and changed and you liked the end result better, which is nice. I'm happy to hear that you, that you enjoyed it. And Kistfer said that I would definitely, like that. The writers she works with that go through this process is hard. By the end, you will like it better. And everything Kister said was exactly dead on the money. I like it better. <laughs> and it was a better book. It was hard work, but it's a better book for it. Yeah, I've, I worked with Kister with my book as well. And it's not easy getting the feedback to be like, okay, but it, this story would make more sense if you ch adjusted it in this way or are you sure that really works with the system that you've built up to this point and having to be honest with myself and go Kisper's right this doesn't quite make as much sense as I, it would if i did these adjustments that and and the thing is you see it in your head as a writer you know right and but it's difficult to see it from another person's perspective and it might hurt your feelings a little bit but in the long run getting your feelings hurt a little bit is worth it if you can tell that story better for right. someone else and and so you know i didn't really get my feelings hurt from it i i actually appreciated it and and ran with it because hard work is what art is art is always mm -hmm. hard work and, it's this idea that like these these insane creative people and it just comes to them like so easy. That's not true. Every artist, every artist you've ever heard of, every writer you've ever heard of that was worth anything put in hard, hard work with their yeah, with, with their product. I mean, it's it's a it's a skill, right? And every right. skill requires the effort to get good at it and to learn the techniques, learn the theory, and apply some mastery to it. And there's obviously different styles. You, you look at different styles of painting, there's different genres and styles of writing, and all these different forms of expression come are the culmination of that person's experiences as well as the effort and the time that they've taken to refine the way that they communicate it to the people around them using whatever medium that they're using. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's basically hurt and experience uh, distilled into something that's meaningful that you can hand to someone else and they get some kind of joy out of that. Mm. And that's what I think art is. I think that's a, a beautiful way to look at it. And so from, from the sound of it, you decided to publish with us at Cinema Ramon partially because of the collaboration with Kistfer and also because of the the offer being made by Kistfer to publish it. Would that be correct? That would be definitely correct. Okay. Um, I would not have written such a good novel without Kistfer. Absolutely not. Well, I'm, I'm glad that, we, uh, that Kistfer is able to help you and that you feel better about your book having gone through that process. I'm sure that Kistra would feel very happy to know that as well. And with uh, with this process, with publishing with Cinnabar Moth, what would you say has been the most surprising thing, thing about publishing with us specifically? Well, the thing about my work 
this work per se is that it's been very it's 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 very dark and it's very disturbing and it's you know and, and there's a lot of content in there that's it's difficult to deal with and but it's the kind of thing that should be dealt with and mm -hmm. Cinnabar Mock didn't shy away from that. And, 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 you know, in fact, they want to shine a light on that kind of thing. So that has been the, 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 the best thing about uh, being on Cinnabar Mock is uh, having a, a partner who's, who's willing to look at all the, the disturbing and the dark and the frightening and go, yeah, you know what? That is frightening. That's scary. But we want to show the world that, you know, not everything is beautiful like a rainbow, but some things are beautiful in other ways. And that sometimes the process to become something is ugly and scary. But, you know, that process is there. That's a real thing. And these things really happen these horrible things really happen and but you know it can be like a seed and something beautiful can come out of it so that's not something a lot of publishers would would want and so you'd say the most surprising thing was the level of acceptance from us that the, yes absolutely the level of acceptance and the, the 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 dealing with and and willing to accept the ugly things and that the ugly things can also bring forth beautiful things too yeah i we we definitely do i've, I've talked with Christopher and i'm part of uh, obviously i'm part of the team i work here but obviously we we um we have talked about that and talked about the the reality that these different genres have their place in these different styles of books. Uh, dark stories as well as, you know, lighter stories both have a place in the in the publishing world and a right to be published. And uh, the thing is, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Rasta. No, it's no problem. Uh, with uh, in particular, I think the the mainstream versus like the indie publishing world do have their own kind of takes on these types of things where oftentimes some of these stories don't get accepted because there's a hesitation about discussing topics that may be sensitive for people rather than being like, hey, these may be sensitive topics, but they deserve a spotlight to be discussed in a way that or to be seen and understood. Correct. And the thing is, despite all the disturbing, despite all the dark, Prophet's Dead is, is really a love story. Um, and it may be difficult. Well, when you read the first chapter, it won't be difficult to see. But as you go into the descent of how the novel goes, it might become obfuscated later on. But remember, the entire novel is actually a love story. Mm. So that that's something that you have to keep in mind as you read. That everything Naomi Pace does is for love. Which oh, Naomi Pace is my, my protagonist. Yeah. So everything she does is for love. And I, I know that might be difficult to believe when you're in the middle of it. You'll see. <laughs> I'm sure that the potential readers who will read it will understand once they've gotten through the book. But Absolutely. it is a journey that they'll have to take. It is a journey, and it's a sometimes painful and sometimes very enjoyable um, journey. But it is that indeed. And so with Prophet's Debt, it is uh, coming out this upcoming Tuesday. And it, you've now gone through this entire process. You've written it and you've done the work to make the adjustments, working with Christopher and going through all of that. And then you've also gone through the process of publishing a book with 
everything that entails. What would you say has been the most surprising aspect of publishing a book and that experience? If there's anything surprising about publishing it this time. I know that you've published one before already. No, I didn't publish one before. Oh, you that, didn't? That, you just, okay. I, it's self-published, uh, which, you know, like, self-publishing, I didn't know how to do it mm. well. I know a lot of people do it really well. Um, and so I was clueless. I basically put it up on Amazon. And some people read it, some people liked it, but you know, as long as one or two people liked it, that was good enough for me at that time. Yeah. You know, and this one I didn't write for publication, so it's 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 a bit it's a bit odd, you know, to to see this out in the world. But the most the thing about publishing is because I'm so clueless, what I focus on is doing the writing itself. I don't know much about the industry. I don't know anything about promotion or things like that. What I try to do is to bring something to the publisher or that, that's beautiful and but ugly at the same time, just mm. like a classic car that's gorgeous but has dings in it. You know, like I, I try to bring that to auction, you know, just like a 59 Chevy. I bring to auction this gorgeous shape, but it's got some dings in it. But people will like that because it's authentic. Right. Has a bit of personality to it. That's right. So <laughs> for me, the autonomy has been great about working with Cinnabon Moth. But as far as like surprising for publication, I don't know much about what's going on. I, I really don't. I just do the best I can with the writing. And when I'm, I'm asked, or, hey, can you answer these questions? I just do the best I can. But the truth is, I, I, I'm i clueless, absolutely, <laughs> utterly clueless. And I think that's okay because, you know, while publishing is a business, in all reality, what I am is an artist. And that's what's great about publishers and agents and things like that. They take something, somebody who's kind of esoteric and weird and strange and it, that makes this piece, this thing, this painting, this, this, this book or whatever, and they make it palatable and and get it to as many people as possible. So I really appreciate those people that take my whatnot and, and go here. Hey, look at this. This is gorgeous. You would love this and, and put it out there. That's something, you know, that I can't do myself. And I really love that about Cinnabon Moth. Well, thank you. It's great to hear these positive things that you're having a very positive experience with this and that you've had a positive experience with the publication of Prophets. Absolutely. And so it is coming out soon. Do you have any plans to celebrate the release of Prophets Debt? Well, here's the thing. Well, <laughs> Prophets is going to be released on a Tuesday, right? Like next yes. Tuesday? So. <laughs> The funny thing about me is this, like one, I live in a rural North Carolina, so there's nothing around me to go do There's, there's, you know, like I know one other published author in this town, she owns a coffee shop. Well, you know, coffee shop closes at three o'clock. So I'm not necessarily going to go down there and be like, Ooh, we're going to party. It's 12 in the afternoon. <laughs> um, but on Tuesdays, I, I go and I do what's called esketamine, it's parvato, it's for depression. I have really severe depression and it's a ketamine derivative. It's a party drug, quite literally. So mm -hmm. on Tuesday next, when my book's getting published, I'm gonna be at a doctor's office legally with the permission of the federal government of the United States under the auspice of a doctor tripping my face off. So oh, yeah. I guess that's what I'm going to do for celebration. Other than that, I'm probably going to come home, pass out, and the next day start writing again. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like you're you don't really have anything special planned necessarily, but I, you do I have don't. things going on. I I do, and I'm always busy, but I'm also always writing. Um, and so really that day. It's going to be like any other day, like every every day that I'm not doing. I don't I don't write on days that I do a sketamine, but 
and by the way, that works really, really well. It has helped my depression quite a bit. Um, I know people are like, Big Pharma is bad, but Big Pharma has helped my life quite, quite a bit. Um, but on those days, I don't write, but most other days, I do. I, I write probably six days a week. So I'm probably going to go do my treatment. And Wednesday night, I'll be back to writing. And I'll probably write every day, even days I go out and celebrate. Let's say I go to a bar and celebrate. I'm going to come home and write a few pages. Because that's, that's, it's just that outlet, you know, like, yeah, it's yeah. something I can't get anywhere else, you know? Yeah, writing is in its own way, a unique way of being able to get thoughts out of your head onto that's right. some paper and to allow them to have a shape and a form. Yeah, and, and I have I have all these voices in my head, and all these voices, they 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 whisper these great ideas for novels and ideas, and 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 they they once they whisper them, I have to put them down on paper. And if right. I don't put them down on paper, they'll drive me absolutely batty. So <laughs> I, I it's 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 a lot of it's it's kind of like you know throwing out something. That, that you need to throw out and, and you know, not like garbage per se, but something that has to get out, you know, that right. has to exit me somehow. And, that, and then that's how it exits me. Just like I did when I was using it as a tool for therapy. That's bad mm. stuff that has to exit my, my mind. Sometimes good stuff. Yeah, and that's a bit of both. And so yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned earlier that you're your wife has been supporting you through your process with writing. Uh, has she or the other uh, members of your family been excited about Prophet Set's release? Well, first place, let me just say the original novel's uh, title, which I won't say, was the, the we were riding in the car um, to one of my treatments on a Tuesday. She actually named the novel, the, the current name. She came mm -hmm. up with that while we were driving in the car to one of my treatments. But of course, she's she's gotten so used to the idea because as you can imagine, this has been going on for, for almost a year now, right. the process. And of course, she's watching me write to uh, th this book and the book before. Um, so would I say she's, you know, jumping up and down? No. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and no one else in my family is either because when you watch me make the sausage, as, as the people say, you don't want to eat it. So they've watched me make the sausage and that's given them, they, they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But I think that the excitement over it is is long past. So... <laughs> Uh, my mother has pre-ordered a copy. I don't know how good of an idea that was for her. Uh, mind you, there's nothing in this book that is a reflection of my parents in any way or my sibling in any way whatsoever. But it is a really disturbing book. And I kind of do wonder about my mother reading this book and going, oh, my. You know, and then I've told her, I say, like, look, it's fiction. I understand all the scary stuff you see and disgusting stuff you know, TV or that you read because my mom reads a lot is fiction. Don't let it be a reflection on you or me or anyone else. Right. It's just fiction. Um, I do have one person that is my OG fan, and I'm giving her a hardback copy of this novel. And I think she's most excited. She's more excited than anyone about that prospect. So I do at least have one person kind of giddy jumping up and down and I'm going to sign a copy and, and give it to her. Oh, that's great. I'm glad that you have a fan that you can have that excitement from and that you've had a uh, support from your family throughout this entire process. Mm, uh, I wouldn't well, say that. I, my, <laughs> mother, my mother has definitely been supportive of my writing, but that's about it. Oh, well, you have support. Oh. Oh well, you know, no, don't don't get me wrong. My sister too, um, but yeah, that's that's my mother and my sister have been great. Um, 
I'm not going to go into the negative. So there you go. The positive thing is you've had some support. And Absolutely. I have great people in my life. My wife, my friends, uh, and my mother and my sister have been great about the whole thing. There you go. So with that, uh, with you having had the support and everything, I think that's wonderful. And having a fam who you're going to be able to give a signed copy to, I'm sure that your fam will love that. That will be very exciting for her. Uh, I want to go back a bit to what okay. you had said earlier. You mentioned when you were a kid that you often visited the library for books and that you were thinking about, you know, looking yourself up and then you looked yourself in the Dewey Decimal System and you mm -hmm. have this very strong bond with libraries as a source of being able to experience authors and experience books. With that, how does it feel to know that your book will be listed in the U.S. Library of Congress? Well, you know, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little morose here for a second. You know, I'm in the United States, right? And based on the kind of creeping acquiescence of fascism here. I don't necessarily find it being listed in the Library of Congress is particularly reassuring. Um, I do like I do have concerns about the stability of my country and also what it could very well mean to be an author who writes about the queer community and uh, the, and communities that are not exactly looked upon with positivity by some of the folks who seek to gain power in my country. So while if the Library of Congress continues to be the system that it is, the fact that one day long from now that I could be whispering in the ear of somebody who is having a hard time and telling them, hey, look, you know, it's gonna be okay through my character, that's super. But I'm I'm quite concerned, uh, mm. uh, you know, with the system that holds up the Library of Congress itself. There's some scary there's some scary shit going down in the United States, man. I think we'll live. I think we'll get through it. But it doesn't mean that I'm not afraid and I don't have concerns. Of course, yeah, I do think that political climates and the uh, situations that might be going on right now can be a cause for concern, and then that's totally reasonable. Well, uh, it's not, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'm an interrupter. It's, it's not a big deal. Uh, so with that, I, I do think that it's understandable to have some uh, uncertainty. It's an uncertain time. It's not the majority of the citizens of the United States. It's just a peculiarity of our electoral system that gives people like that outsized power. Most people, and the U.S. stand against that kind of censorship and right. hatred. And I, I think that it might not be reflected in our government, but it is a fact that most people don't care for that. And, and that's something I think the rest of the world should know, that mm. often we're not represented rep, rep, represented by our elected officials in a manner in which we, the majority, think and care about. Right. And so it's, that's an unfortunate situation, but you did mention that it would be exciting to be able to, if you could have certainty about it, know that your book would be something that someone could pick up and read at the library Absolutely. and connect with. Absolutely. And, you know, it allows me to show them the time that I lived in and show them the way that that time that I live in has made the time that they live in in the future, but also show them that really people haven't changed. And, you know, that the lived experience that I have is obviously different than someone who lived 100 years ago or 100 years from now. But the essence of the human experience and the human uh, 
you know, viscera is still the same. And, mm. and that's kind of what I want to hopefully put out there, just not now, but in perpetuity. I think that's a, a wonderful message to want out there and to have it be immortalized through your written word, so to speak. In a minor fashion, yes. Uh, so with that, with you, you have all this coming up with uh, Prophet's death, with its upcoming release, and once it's released, it's sort of the process for it kind of finishes, right? Right. What do you hope happens next? As far as what I hope happens with Prophet's death, or what am I working on? Uh, what you hope happens next with Prophet's death? Or if you have some things you're working on, you want to talk about a little bit. Well, uh, obviously, I hope Prophet Stet sells a whole bunch of copies. <laughs> who <laughs> does it? Uh, you know, who who does it? So that's what I hope happens next. It sells a whole bunch of copies. Libraries pick it up and hand it out to young people to read on mass for free. Uh, but of course, like every author. Like every artist, I'm on to the next thing. For me, Prophet's Debt, wipe my hands of that in early part of 2022. Right now, I'm about I'm 204 or five pages into a new novel that wow. I plan on having done around the beginning of fall. And I also have a novella that I'm so hoping that I have time and creativity to complete by the end of the year. So by the end of the year, I hope to have completed a new novel and a new novella. But we'll see about the novella because I haven't began working on it yet because I can't work on two things at one time. My mind doesn't work like that. I'm sure there are people that write two books at one time. I'm not that person. But right now I'm, you know, more than halfway, maybe 60% through a new book that I plan on having done, you know, mm. like I said, in a few months. And then I really, really, fingers crossed, hope that I can get to work on a novella right after that. And I'll have the stamina and the creativity to move forward with. So that's what I'm working on. Okay. No, no spoilers, though. You won't get anything out of me. <laughs> I won't try. I won't try. I believe you. So... You you mentioned that writing is something that you think you'll probably be doing your entire life. And are you hoping or wanting writing to also be a career, or is it just something that you plan on doing? Well, careers. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever read. Have you ever read Into the Wild by John uh, Krakauer? I don't believe I have, no. Okay, well, they made a movie out of it. Uh, Sean Penn made the movie. Anyway, but I love the book back, you know, um back in the day and, and you know because that book's been out for almost 20 years now maybe a little longer now i can't remember but anyway john krakauer wrote this book about this kid named chris mccandless right chris mccandless is a real person he graduated from emory back in the 1990s and he went off and he he donated all of his money to charity um he's a rich kid donated all his money to charity took off in his car out west, burned everything in his wallet from his cash to his ID, left his car there, and hitchhiked around the country, ended up in Alaska. Unfortunately, he perished in Alaska because he starved to death. But before that happened, he said to a, a man who was a father figure to him, they, uh, his last name was Franz, he said something along the lines of Mr. Franz, I think careers are a 20th century invention, invention, and I don't want to have one. And that's kind of how I look at careers as a whole. I mean, it's art. Does that art support me financially? Will, am I willing to sacrifice to make the art support me financially? I would love it if all the stuff that I put on the page was lauded by you know, critics and whatnot, and 
you know, and they paid me heaps of money for it that I could then in turn donate to organizations that deserve it more than I do. But I don't foresee that actually happening. So I try to look at the things that I can have versus the things I want to have. Maybe I want to have a new electric car, but currently I can't afford one. So I'm driving this 15 year old car. So I put <laughs> this, which is true. So I put this electric car out of my mind and say, okay, right now I can't have that car. So I don't right. think about it. So I don't think about an idea of a career from the writing. I think that careers are something that are contrived to give you the money that you need to live your life. I'm pretty happy living the life I live. And I'm mm. hoping that my art does provide. But if it doesn't, then I'm not going to be upset because it's something that I never expected to have in the first place. And I put out of my mind of having. And of course, I'm not going to change my art to have it. So, you know, I'm not going to suddenly start writing something that's opposed to the way that I think and I feel just to get a paycheck. So, you know, ideal world, that'd be rad. Will it happen? <laughs> Probably not. So I've just put it out of my mind. Okay. So it's something where you'll take it if it comes, but it's not something that you're going to go out of your way to do. You're going to be your focus is on having your artistic expression and being That's true right. to that. And yeah, I, I don't have a choice, man. I got I got to put those words on paper or, you know, the, the voices in my head that tell me to put the words on the paper are like, come on now, you can, <laughs> you get to it or we're going to start bothering you even more. So, mm. you know, it's it's not optional, even if those pages don't get out to the world. So I want to follow up on this. I, you, you mentioned that you don't really put these things in mind, uh, or rather you don't think about desire for these things that you can't really control. That's right. Uh, but if we imagine, for example, that Profit's debt were to become a bestseller, do you think that you would do anything with that? Or would it just be like, cool, that happened, and then you just move on? Basically, cool, that happened. And I would sit down and continue writing. Like, see, that's the thing. It's kind of like, oh, cool, I've published a novel, which is insane because I never thought that would happen, right. um, especially with the kind of stuff that I'm working with and being like an allegory and working on it being a, a therapeutic tool. It's this, it just, you know, that's insane that it happened to begin with. So for me, everything after this is just, a, a topping on top of an ice cream sundae man so like if that were to come to pass you know it's like oh, wow that's insane that's great i gotta get back to writing so <laughs> you know because that's just where my heart is and where i've got to be so there would be a brief moment of time where i'm like this is cool okay let me get out to my keyboard um mm -hmm. Rick, because that's that's where it all came from in the first place is sitting down with the blank page and in process putting what i can put on that page right. so you know I, am i going to, is it going to change me or anything like that no no i don't think anything really could i'm pretty cast in stone at this point okay so it's exciting but you're still you in the end of the day. Yeah, and I'll probably, <laughs> if I make a lot of money on it, I'll probably donate it. A lot mm. of it, like Planned Parenthood or something like that. That's probably where a lot of my money will go. Um, you know, animal rescues and Planned Parenthood, definitely. Okay, so for you, even if you were to get money and such, you'd, you'd rather put that to something else rather than keep it for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy, you know, like, um, I have everything I, I pretty much need. Um, I, and the things that I have that break, I can fix it. Right. Um, of course, I'm, you know, I live in a, a small house with one bathroom. And one day I would like two bathrooms, uh, you know, but little things like that, nothing huge. I don't want to live in a big city. I don't want to live in a big house. Um, there's a small town that my 
in-laws live in, in in the mountains um, that I might would, would buy a, a house in that small town. And, you know, they're not expensive. They're expensive to me right now. And they're not expensive to a best-selling author. Um, right. And that's probably something I would do. And it's got a little downtown. I can walk around and, you know, and, and, and that's probably what I do of my, my, my money. And, and like I said, fuck the rest of it. You know, like this, this dog is going to get put down. Nope. Nope. Here, take the donation. Keep that dog. Here's the, Mm. here's the surgery for that dog. You know, women's rights are being, uh, uh, limited by the government. Uh, here's some money for Planned Parenthood, you know, like do what you can do with that. I mean, that like, that's, that's what I would do with my, my cash and also notoriety. Um, somebody has to stand up and, and point <laughs> the finger and say, that's messed up. Don't do that. Or that's yes. messed up. We should do that. You know? Right. So that's what I would do with that kind of notoriety. Okay. So let's imagine uh, following this this theme of bestseller, because it's it's kind of hypothetical. But we imagine you know you find the success, and then let's say profit stack goes from being bestseller to receiving a movie or TV series deal. Would you accept that deal? And if you did, do you have an idea of who you'd want to be cast in any of the roles? Well, here's the thing that I have a problem with when it comes to the entertainment system community, not system, but the entertainment community, it's, it's a lot of nepotism, you know, uh, my, you, 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 you know, somebody's mom and dad are famous actors. So then they're famous actors Somebody's mom and dad's, a, uh, you know, an, a publishing agent. So they're a publishing agent, you know, right. and things like that. And, and you've got all these people that have been in all these big movies. Yeah, and they're great actors, and some of them did come from nowhere. Some of them came, from, hey, all of them are great, you know, regardless of whether they came from a little bit of privilege and they got to step up. But there are plenty of people who didn't get to step up and are great actors. Mm-hmm. I want those actors. I don't want Brad Pitt. I don't want you know well-known actors. Not not to knock Brad Pitt because he seems like a stand-up dude, but I don't want those guys. I want somebody someone doesn't know i want an opportunity for the unknown person to get a chance to 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 have a have a piece that they can work on and not right. mention i also want this is southern gothic thriller horror i want real southern actors i want real lgbt actors i want real autistic actors and i want it done here I want it done in the South. I want it done in North Carolina, not on a studio set. Okay, so if you if you are going to be doing this, you'd want a certain level of creative control to be able to say, hey, I want to have some authenticity to the roles where the actors match with their roles or actresses match with their roles. Mm-hmm. And I want to have this set in the setting that is, the book is set in. That's right. Nothing drives me. Nothing drives a Southerner. It's like crazy, like seeing someone portraying their region or portraying them on screen and seeing through the put on accent. Mm. It's, it's like chewing on aluminum foil and lint. It's repulsive. And, you know, you feel like, why is this British guy playing someone from South Carolina? I can tell that that's not a real accent. Maybe that guy in Los Angeles can't, or New York can't. I can't, and he's supposed to be representing us. And I have a problem with that. You would like your representation to be actual representation. That's right. <laughs> Just like I would like it if, you know, uh, Naomi Pace is a gay woman. I want a, a woman who is a gay woman to play a gay woman. Mm. I don't think that's a lot to ask. I think there are definitely gay women who work in the business. So yes. it shouldn't be that much of a stretch to have that representation be accurate. Correct. Uh, so with this, with uh, the concept of movie or TV series, 
are you would you be leaning towards preferring profit set to be a movie or a tv show which one do you think would be a better fit well obviously a tv show would be better because this prestige television that they put out today is is of, of highest quality i mean we really do live in a, in a really amazing age of television i grew up it was like the a team it's some of the worst shit you've ever seen you know <laughs> but you know like it, it was basically like soap operas but all day on tv until the tv went to that screen where it's like we'll be back at 6 a.m right. you know but today the, the level of, of, of creativity, the level of production value is outrageous. And there's such detail in Profit Stat. I would want a TV series, you know, with the first season at least being eight shows. Because there's a lot of mythology behind it that I haven't talked about. And, then, you know, it would be great to flesh that mythology out in an extended you know, version of the novel. And I also think to some degree movies are a thing of the past. Um, they are so brief. I don't feel like you really get your, your excitement, your money's worth and, and your storytelling worth that you get out of an eight part TV series. Right. Okay. So definitely a TV series, preferably HBO if they're listening. <laughs> hey, HBO. There's an offer right there. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, they made um they've they've made some really great television. Um and you know I would I I I I wouldn't have a problem being lined up with the same people that made True Detective and being put on that same pedestal. Mm -hmm. I I would love it. Absolutely. And, and really, in a lot of ways, it, it's in the same kind of Southern Gothic horror thriller um, vein. So it would fit right there in HBO. Okay. I won't turn down Showtime or Netflix either. Hey, you'll take, you'll, you'll take it. I'll take it. I'm being facetious, but go ahead. <laughs> so let's imagine now that you got the offer for let's say HBO, and they've taken Profit's debt, turned it into a TV show, it's gone through this entire process, and you know, the, the creative process and the release, and it's going to the premiere. Would you go to the premiere, and who would you take with you if you did? Hell yes, I'm going to the premiere, and I'm, of course I'm taking my wife, who I've been with for 13, going on 14 years, I've been married 12 years. Um, and I would also take my friend Patrice, who is my OG of some OG fans, who read mm -hmm. the first version of the book. The She's maybe the second person besides my wife that's read it. She read the rough draft that became, so it, that was written in the third person, and loved that. So she's my OG of some OG fans. So she and my wife are going with me to the premiere. Awesome. I think it's great to hear that. And, and following, up, following up with this and this concept of success and movie, TV shows, with that comes with it a certain level of fame, right? You become more known with all these different ways of being exposed to people in these new ways, your name getting out there. Would you like to be famous and well-known? Perhaps, like, for example, and perhaps an extreme example, but for example, Stephen King, where you lose your anonymity? Well, one thing, I'm not a very anonymous person to begin with. Um, I have a blog that, okay, so there was this white supremacist group and they're still kind of around in, in fragments and pieces. And um, I knew someone who, event, who one day started becoming enamored with this group. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't happy with that idea. So I started my own web page and I wrote a couple of articles about this group. Those articles blew up. Um, mm -hmm. I've gotten tens and tens and tens of thousands of reads. I get read every day across the world. Um, and eventually what happened is that the guy who was 
I'm not going to mention names, but he was kind of in charge, was the mouthpiece for him, got so put off by it that he quit and unpublished a lot of his self-published novels. I've gotten death threats from neo-Nazis for years now. They know who I am. You know, guys like Richard Spencer, they know who I am. Those guys, you know, in, 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 that, that were in uh, Charlottesville, a lot of those guys know who I am. And they hate me. And fuck them because, good, I'm glad they hate me because if you want to be hated, <laughs> those are the kind of people that should hate you. They hate me for what I do and what I say and stand up to them because someone like me isn't supposed to say those things and say those things about them and try to undermine them. So I'm not losing anonymity because I've lost it years ago. But as far as what I like to be, Stephen King, yes, but not because of the money, but because it would multiply my ability to accomplish one of my favorite things, which is pissing off all the right people, homophobes and racist fucks. If I can piss them off to the day that I die, then I'll be happy. It would make me so happy every single day knowing that something I wrote, which I already have, but could be amplified to reach and, 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 and just drive them absolutely crazy while simultaneously giving hope to the people that they hate, I, I couldn't think of a better life to live. I think that's awesome, having the desire to not not only just make them angry, but make them angry for the right reasons, where you're being a positive force in the world, whereas they would want to be a negative one. That's right. Well, I'm also, look, what you have to understand about me, I'm from North Carolina. I, I am from, I graduated from a, a very strict, hateful, all-white Christian school. I'm named after a Confederate general. My middle name is E. Lee. My name is literally Robert E. Lee. And I know it's grammatically incorrect, which is kind of ironic. But <laughs> they, I, I grew up in being taught by my father and my grandfather things that are horrible and I won't go into. I was programmed to be a person that they wanted me to be, to be their clone. And I rejected it like it was the fucking matrix. And I, um, so to these people, these neo-Nazis and fascist fucks, I am not just someone they disagree with, but I'm an apostate and a traitor. Mm. And so it makes me doubly happy to be able to, you know, find another way to drive them crazy and to then look at kids who are from situations like mine and come from backgrounds like mine and say, you don't have to buy that bullshit. You can right. love all people. You don't have to hate. Hate weighs you down. Hate makes you miserable. Let it go. Put it down. Walk away. And people who think like that, walk away from them in your life too because they've added no value to it. Right. So, yeah, I know I went on a rant, but... No, that's I what think I that's, I'm a, I'm I, a writer. Think, yeah, and I think this is a, a, a very important message, you know, to be able to express to people and be like, hey, just because the there are people in your life who try to instill hate in you and try to bring you to this hateful way of thinking and way of living doesn't mean you have to. You don't have to abide by those rules concepts and those biases and those terrible uh, views of the world. That's right. In fact, you should fight against them. Mm -hmm. That's exactly I, what I you think, should. I think that express that to people and, you know, saying that they're not alone in the struggle against those types of influences and that there are other people like them is an important thing for people to know because sometimes people can feel very isolated in these situations and feel like there's not really a way out and be able to have people they could potentially reach out to or to feel connection with at the very least is important well i've been doing that a long time i because i because of my psychiatric 
issues because I no longer have a, a you know, I'm not steadily out there in the world because I'm not particularly good at it. But when I was a school teacher, I was one of the first Gay Straight Alliance faculty sponsors in the state of North Carolina, and that was in the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. So that's also part of the reason that I started writing this book, because what you just said, because someone needs they need to be able to go to someone and, and talk to them, an adult or someone with experience. And, you know, that's what I decided to do. And that's also part of where this novel came from, from mentoring high school kids whose parents rejected them. Right. Who they could be out at home. Right. Yeah. So they could come to me and I will never out you to your parents. You know, I will never say anything about this to your parents. They can fucking fire me for it. They almost did. But guess what? They can't. So, you know, now that I don't have that, this is what I could think to do. You know, it's to write this and how does it represent those kids I used to work with? And how does it get in the ear of someone who needs to hear it? Right. And so I'm so excited that this book can continue that mission, even though I'm not out in, in the world, so to say, as much as I used to be. Yeah, I think that is a wonderful uh, message and goal with uh, the Prophet Step. Uh, book and I would like to thank you Rob for talking with me today and sharing this and being on the writer's triangle you got it and I'd like to thank all of our beautiful moths for listening as well and tuning in be sure to buy Prophet's Debt coming out July 5th 2022 uh, Rob can you tell everybody where they can find you for social media links oh yeah um I'm busy pissing people off on Twitter and <laughs> it's at Robert Creekmore. So R O B E R T C R E E K M O R E. Just like the two words Creek and more put together. So at Robert Creekmore. Look me up. And there you have it. And be sure to visit cinnabarmoth.com to check out the transcripts. We'll also have the links to all of Rob's social media. Rob, thank you again for talking with me today. Thank you, Rasa. And take care and bye-bye.